So let's go ahead, pull up the slides. Where's my mouse? Here we go. All right, so for today's lecture, we're gonna be talking about battery technologies. So last time we've covered sort of the drivetrain um, at, at a higher level. And I guess you could consider this kind of part of the drivetrain, right? This is what's providing energy into your motors. Um, so we're going to do a deep dive on some of the sort of engineering aspects of batteries, um, but also looking at some of the economic aspects um, and future potential of, of these technologies. Okay. Um, quick refresher uh, of how batteries work. This is the sort of basic structure of any sort of type of battery. And there can be sort of different sets of confer configurations for a battery. But in general, you're pretty much always gonna look like this. Um, there are three major components for a battery. You've got your cathode, uh, your anode, and your electrolyte. So the cathode is the positive terminal. Um, I think if you remember back in like high school chemistry, right, you can think of the T as like the plus, that's how you remember it. Um, the anode is the negative terminal uh, and the electrolyte is where um, you get, uh, that's the medium through which the ions of your cathode or anode are exchanged. Um, your battery can be in a high energy state, which means it's charged or a low energy state, which means it's basically empty. And so when you are going from a high energy state to a low energy state, um, the anode will exchange cations to the cathode and ion, anions to the anode. And this causes a flow of electrons through a circuit. And that is essentially how electricity is being generated by the battery, okay? And so, at a high energy state, the battery inherently, from sort of a, a chemical perspective, right, is storing all of this energy. And then by producing electricity, it'll transition to a low energy state. And to get back to a high energy state, you have to put energy back into the system, okay? And so if you are um, putting electricity essentially into the battery, that can cause the flow of electrons going the other direction. And so you have the exact opposite sort of a chemical reaction happening in the battery um, to bring you back to a high energy state. Uh, okay, yes. Oh, sorry. So the microphone is just for recording the video, but I will try and project. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, so this is like not connected to any of the speakers here. I think there's a different microphone, but yeah. If if folks can't hear me, let me know. Um, otherwise, yeah, this microphone is just for recording the lecture. Um, okay. So, any questions about battery operation? Hopefully, this is kind of a light refresher for any chemistry courses you may have taken in the past. Um, we're not going to get too specific into the chemistry, although we will talk about different sort of battery technologies that are comprised of different sort of chemistries that build that are either uh, differ in your cathode, anode, and even sometimes the, the electrolyte. Okay, so battery operation in electric vehicles. Uh, before we kind of dive into this, we have to clarify some of the common uh, nomenclature and terms that we use when we talk about batteries. So the first one is the state of charge. So this is how much energy is left in the battery, typically expressed as a percentage. So, right, if you grab your smartphone or you're looking at your laptop, right, you can see the battery, um, the little battery icon telling you how full it is. That refers to the state of charge. Um, and connected to what I was just talking about before, that is related to the sort of high energy state and low energy state of the battery. Um, capacity dictates uh, 
how much energy can be stored in the battery when it's full. Okay, and so when we think about the units of energy uh, that we're talking about, um, this is in kilowatt hours, right? For um, you know a full battery that's being used for an electric vehicle, um, but for something like a phone or a laptop, it could be um, in the units of like watt hours. Um, and, and so the, the unit for capacity is gonna be energy and the size of the battery will be sort of dictated by how much energy uh, that battery can store. <clears throat> so the part that gets a little bit confusing um, and a little bit less straightforward is the idea of this effective slash um, net capacity. So this is known as the usable range of the battery. So to give an example, suppose, um, suppose your phone has like, the, the actual capacity of the battery of your phone might be some like 10 units of energy, right? But in reality, you might only be able to use say eight or nine units out of the, those 10. And the reason why they do that is because there is a little bit of buffer right at the bottom and a little buffer right at the top so that your battery in your phone does never actually goes all the way down to 0% or all the way up to 100%. Um, and the reason for that is when batteries get all the way to this low energy state or high energy state, it accelerates the sort of degradation uh, of the battery. So by having this buffer at the, at the sort of bottom and at the top of the battery, um, it will make the battery last much, much longer, okay? Um, and, and actually this, this, if you have experienced any of the sort of controversies about um, like iPhone, uh, how long the, the iPhone battery lasts and how they sort of manage it and they don't let you use the sort of full size of the battery. You may have seen that in, in the media um, like a year or two ago, uh, that's kind of related to this particular issue. <clears throat> okay, uh, battery cycling uh, or a charge cycle. This is basically, if I, take the, uh, if I take my battery and I use it all the way down and then I charge it back up, that's like one, essentially one sort of full discharge cycle. Um, it doesn't always need to go, you know, down to the sort of low, low uh, capacity. You can cycle it up and down at sort of different ranges within the capacity, but a cycle just refers to a discharge and charge up cycle. Um, the depth of discharge refers to uh, how far down in the state of charge that you go in within a single sort of battery cycle. Um, so if you are, for example, constantly doing a large depth of discharge, that might mean I'm going from, you know, my 100% state of charge down to, you know, 5, 10% state of charge every time, as opposed to sort of a moderate depth of discharge where I might be going from 100% down to 50% and then charging that back up. And so all of these things can have sort of different effects on, um, on the battery lifetime and the sort of efficiency of the battery. All right, any questions or confusions about any of these terms? Okay, great. So actually the first thing we're gonna look at is battery degradation. Um, so this was related to, I think the first question on the poll. Uh, and so we're gonna see what types of things affect uh, a battery's lifetime. So a lot of these, um, a lot of these graphs are kind of based right out of, uh, based out of sort of empirical lab work where people, you know, have these batteries and they subject them to different conditions. And this is a way that, you know, if I start building electric vehicles and I put these batteries in them and there's these questions about like, oh, how long are these batteries going to last? Uh, especially right at the beginning, like how could you possibly know without actually 
just using the battery in the EV. And so this, these, these types of tests and these sets of tests are, are ways in which we have some insight into uh, how batteries behave over their lifetime. Okay. And so there's a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of different factors that cause a battery to degrade. Um, and basically all of those things that I had on that list in the poll uh, will contribute to battery degradation. So larger depth of discharge, if you are going to a sort of low, uh, lower state of charge, that leads to accelerated degradation. So if we look at this particular chart here, um, and, and we'll look at a couple sort of different ones. So these are sort of number of cycles. So how many times you uh, use the battery, charge it back up, use the battery, charge it back up. So a thousand times, 2000 times, and so on and so forth. And we can see, uh, for example, if I, let's look at the sort of top one, the orange guy versus the black line. So the black line goes from 100% down to 75% state of charge, okay? And so um, this, is, this is kind of a deeper depth of discharge, right? And that is leading to the most degradation. And so when I, when I talk about degradation, it means how much of your original capacity are you retaining? Um, so over time, right, you, as you use the battery more and more, its overall capacity ends up sort of decreasing, its effective capacity decreases. Uh, so for this guy, where I'm doing 75% state of charge cycles, it's going down to what, below 80% after about 4,000 cycles. Whereas with the 75 to 65% state of charge um, discharge, right? That's only a 10% compared to a 75%. Um, those cycles lead to still above uh, or close to 95% of your original capacity. Um, we can also see, uh, yeah, let me find two that are kind of similar. Yeah, okay, so you might say, well, that's not a super fair comparison because this one, this black line is discharging 75% of the battery. This is only discharging 10% of the battery. Okay, so it's not a sort of apples to apples comparison, but it is telling you something, right? Like the, uh, it's not just the number of cycles, it's also how far it's going and how much you're, you're using it. But here we can compare like a 50% use of the battery. This is 100 to 50% versus 75 to 25%. So that is this blue line versus this teal line. And you can see after 5,000 cycles, the dark blue line, which is going from 100% to 50%, um, is at 80% retention, whereas the Teal one is somewhere between 85 and 90 percent. All right, so what does that mean, sort of practically speaking, for an EV? Right, if I'm uh, if I'm driving my car and I charge it from uh, if I go charge it all the way full and I drive it till it's halfway and I do that many times, that's going to degrade my battery faster than if I leave my car at 75 percent and drive it down to 25 percent. Um, right, in, in, in a lab. So there are, uh, with, with, with electric vehicles, um, they try and mitigate this issue as much as possible. So you can try and bring these lines together. Um, but from a sort of purely sort of physics, chemistry perspective, that is how the degradation is, is kind of gonna happen. Which isn't to say like, you know, if you're driving an electric car, like don't charge it up all the way full, right? Um, there are a lot of um, sort of fail safes and buffer in the battery that, that helps to get around these sorts of issues. Um, let's see, do I have a graph on the speed? Yeah, I do, okay. So we'll look at some of the other ways that they're degrading quickly as well. So one of the options was about temperature. Um, so battery degradation happens uh, at an accelerated pace across different temperatures. So if you are at extreme temperatures, very hot, 
or very cold that can also lead to accelerated degradation. And this is why uh, almost all electric vehicles uh, with the exception of the Nissan Leaf has an active cooling system in order to ensure that your battery isn't operating um, at really hot or really cold temperatures. Um, the Nissan Leaf has a passive cooling system. So when you're driving, it, it takes advantage of sort of passive airflow over the battery to, to cool it. Um, but the, the like earliest versions of the Leaf, um, I remember when we were kind of hearing about when it first came out, uh, there were Leafs in Texas that were losing like half of the battery capacity over the summer um, because of issues related to temperature degradation. Uh, so we can see here, um, as you do uh, sort of more, more and more cycles, right? What happens, um, the relative degradation percentages uh, at uh, higher temperatures, okay? And so, um, Essentially, the higher the temperature that you are uh, charging and discharging your vehicle, that you're cycling the vehicle, um, the, the greater the degradation percentage, as you can see in, in this table here. So after 250 cycles of, uh, of this particular battery and this particular experiment, right, they were seeing a 4% decrease um, in the overall capacity if you're doing it at 25 degrees Celsius versus a 13% decrease um, if you're doing it at 55 degrees Celsius. So again, you don't need to like know these numbers specifically, right? It's a particular experiment on a particular type of, um, one particular type of battery in these sort of laboratory settings. But again, the trend is pretty consistent. Um, we know that at the sort of extremes of temperatures, the battery is gonna uh, degrade faster. So this one doesn't show degradation at like really low temperatures, but it's uh, a similar type of effect where once you're starting to get really cold conditions, um, the, it will lead to sort of lower, lower effective capacity. Um, that is a legitimate concern, right, among electric vehicle owners today. So if you live out in the Northeast um, where it gets really cold in the winter, um, this, uh, we, we, we know empirically, right, that a lot of the range of the vehicle will sort of decrease during the winter seasons because the battery operates less uh, efficiently at those uh, cold temperatures. All right, any questions about that? Next one is charging speed. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the different sort of charging rates, right? You can do sort of your level one wall outlet, level two dryer outlet, and then DC fast charging um, at sort of higher and higher speeds. Um, DC fast charging, right, starts at 50 kilowatts, going up to as high as 350, even 400 kilowatts um, these days. Uh, and so what we can see here um, is they all, they all have different axes, so we have to kind of um, reinterpret these graphs every time, but basically the capacity loss per equivalent full cycle. So basically, the higher up on the y-axis, the more uh, capacity in the battery that you're losing, okay? And so at one C charge, that's your sort of lowest, you can see uh, here, um, this compared to char charging it at six C leads to, uh, this is a log scale on the y-axis. So this is something like 10 times lower capacity loss. Um, and again, uh, a lot of these things have been somewhat minimized. And so empirically, even for people um, who are fast charging a lot, like the degradation isn't 
hugely significant uh, compared to if you're just slow charging. But again, there is kind of this empirical fact here that as you uh, charge up the battery and discharge the battery uh, at higher rates, um, then you will degrade the battery faster. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend, uh, so, so, I, so it's not really a problem to kind of fast charge when you need to, um, but I would not recommend um, charging it like a 350 kilowatt station every day, every time you're charging up your, uh, your battery, because that probably would degrade it uh, a little bit more. So there's another kind of interesting thing related to um, charging speed. Um, so we, I've given the sort of generic thing about, okay, if you plug in your car, um, then it'll charge at this specific power rate and it'll take you know, X minutes to, to charge up the, the, the vehicle. Um, but it's actually a little bit different. It's a little bit more nuanced. So if you fill up a, a, a tank of gas, basically any gas station you go to, you fill it up. It takes roughly the same amount of time because um, it fills at a fairly constant rate. Um, but the rate of charging is typically uh, not constant and it's gonna be related to the state of charge of your vehicle and the charging rate. Um, and that's actually because the voltage of your battery changes, right? And so if you think about like Ohm's law, what would that do for the amps going into your car as the sort of voltage of the battery changes? Um, a really, so at, at lower charging rates, this is a lot less apparent. Um, you will see a fairly sort of linear charge rate if you're doing it like level one and even at level two. But if you are doing something like DC fast charging, especially on a large capacity battery, um, you should expect that the rate will change quite a bit as the vehicle state of charge gets closer and closer to full. The general rule of thumb that we like to give people is that if you go from 0% to 80% state of charge of your battery, that is about the same amount of time as it takes to go from 80% up to 100% of the battery. Um, so this is pretty common, like for EV owners who are doing like a long road trip, like if you wanna drive from NorCal down to um, Los Angeles, uh, you, can, you can sit there at a fast charging station, maybe halfway down your trip, and you would charge up to, most people will, um, take the time to charge up to like 80% as opposed to doubling the time and charging up to 100%. Uh, and here we can see uh, a couple sort of charging curves uh, of, of what that looks like. Um, here we can see, so one of the, one of the or let's see, the, the two fast ones that can take really high um, charging power is the Porsche Taycan and the Model 3, they both start at 250 kilowatts. So that means they're at like these, one of these really fast, uh, you know, 250, 300 kilowatt um, stations. Uh, Electrify America has uh, a good number of them around now. And you can see how they both start at 250, but they'll both sort of start to trend downwards quite a bit uh, over time as the voltage of the battery goes up. Yeah. Oh, this, this is the, uh, this refers to the average charging power. Um, so uh, it's in kilowatts. Yeah, so um, when we talk about charging for electric vehicles, um, we'll mainly be sort of working in kilowatts for power and kilowatt hours for energy, right? So you can see kind of how, how the average is. And so um, when you look at these vehicles and you look at like spec sheets or attributes of these vehicles, they'll kind of tell you 
what the sort of max charging speed of the vehicle is. Um, but that, but you should never expect that you'll be able to achieve those charging speeds for really sort of long periods of time. And these kind of measurements are sort of much more accurate indicator of what you can expect um, when you charge these vehicles. Um, yeah, and it's pretty interesting. Uh, you'll, you'll, you know that like uh, the Tesla Model 3 and the Porsche Taycan, um, they both are able to have this max charging speed of like 250 kilowatts, right? But then one of them goes down like this, but the other one kind of holds it for a while, then drops and holds it for a while, then drops, right? Then that is entirely having to do with the sort of management system uh, of the battery in that vehicle. Um, and looking at charts like this gives you kind of an indication of how, uh, how they operate functionally. Okay, any questions about that? Yeah, and, you know, I think as it relates to this, you know, the pattern in which these shapes look, right, like whether or not flat drop, flat drop versus continuous drop is like better for the battery, I think time will, will tell. Um, different automakers are kind of experimenting with different methods of managing the sort of charging. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I, I can't speak to kind of if one particular sort of shape is necessarily better than, than another. Um, okay, so we've talked about like all these different ways that, um, that the batteries get affected by all of these conditions. Um, and so to give you guys a sense of empirically, what that looks like for vehicles. Um, so someone ran around and collected all this data for a bunch of different um, Teslas um, and how they've degraded based off of how much they've been sort of driven. So this is essentially a proxy, right, for how much they're being used. And, you know, people will use the vehicles in different ways. Some people are gonna charge at home. Some people are gonna be charging, fast charging all the time. Um, some people will drive really conservatively and some people are, you know, pedal to the metal. Um, and so you get this sort of broad range of different degradation profiles. Uh, and, and also, right, people live in different conditions. You might be in like mild San Diego or you might be in the hot summers of Texas or cold winters of the Northeast. But this is kind of what we see in the data, okay? Um, and so after 100,000 kilometers, 150,000 kilometers, you are on the order of losing about five, seven percent, um, five, six, seven percent of the capacity of your battery. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, you, you may have a, um, like if you buy a like Tesla Model S and it has some kind of range on it, um, what you'll actually find is that, that, that the range is kind of a subjective number depending on how you drive. Um, so I could, uh, if I drive really efficiently, um, the range of my vehicle can be higher than the rated range of the vehicle. Uh, and so in some instances, there are some groups of people who um, do a really sort of good job of uh, driving their vehicle efficiently and getting a sort of higher range um, out of their vehicle uh, than, than is sort of, than it's rated at. And yeah, we'll actually talk about this in the efficiency lecture next week. Um, there are a group of like, EV enthusiasts who do this thing called like hypermiling. Um, and they drive so efficiently that they can like double the range of the vehicle. Um, but it's more, it's not for like regular on the street driving. Uh, yeah, okay. So generally speaking, we can see how this sort of degradation profile looks. Um, 
And I think these types of profiles are kind of becoming apparent in, in lots of other vehicle models as well. So we're getting a better and better sense of what degradation looks like over time. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, the last thing I'll say about this is, um, you know, a lot of people might not know or be comfortable with kind of the uh, degradation of these batteries. And so there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of discussion amongst regulators and amongst the automakers about making sort of battery warranty guarantees so that if you reach some kind of threshold, they'll just give you a new battery for free. Um, and there are, are sort of lots of numbers being thrown around. Um, the one recently that I've heard is that they want to guarantee uh, after 10 years of use that if the battery state of char, if the remaining range goes below 80% of its rated range, then, then they have to give you a new battery. Um, but that's not an actual sort of requirement yet or, or regulation. So that remains to be seen if, um, if one, regulators decide to force automakers to have those warranty guarantees, or two, if automakers will take it upon themselves to provide those guarantees. All right. So uh, the other, the next question on the poll was about um, what sorts of battery chemistries, right, are being used in electric vehicles. Um, and they actually are, are all lithium ion batteries. And we'll talk about the types of lithium ion batteries that, that they use um, in just a moment. Okay, so there is kind of a fundamental um, trade-off in terms of um, the energy and power density of, uh, of a battery. And so you can essentially tune it or, or use specific chemistries that might favor something like having a high energy density, which means you have a lot of range versus a high power density, which means that you can sort of output um, output energy out of the battery faster. Um, and so oftentimes there is this sort of direct trade-off between energy and power. Um, and so deciding if you want to go up as opposed to, to, the, to the right. Uh, but there are you know, other potential chemistries, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that may kind of let you do better in sort of both directions. This is also the reason why um, electric vehicles have started in smaller formats. Okay, so um, I, I may have mentioned this before, but if you think about, okay, the first electric vehicles to come out, it's the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Volt, right? That's a sort of compact sedan. Um, and now 12 years later, we're finally getting the first like, electric trucks, right? The Rivian R1T, the Tesla Cybertruck, the Ford F-150, um, and we have a whole slew of uh, SUVs and crossover SUVs. Um, so having EVs in these larger formats compared to the smaller vehicles um, that were on the market in the 2010s, and that has to do with uh, this, this idea, right, that um, the energy density, uh, if I wanted to just start out by having a really large range in a truck, you might not have enough power for it. And so the technology and the costs have gone, evolved in such a way over the last decade that it's now becoming easier and easier to, to start to electrify these larger format vehicles. Okay. So bunch of different chemistries um, for these uh, batteries. And so these refer to, um, typically are gonna be referring to the cathode materials, um, as I was mentioning. So this is the positive, um, 
um, positive node of the battery. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of these chemistries. Um, it's not critical for you to kind of memorize them, um, but it's giving you some idea about different characteristics based off of the chemistries uh, and some pros and cons and issues related to some of these materials as well. So one of the earlier ones in the sort of lithium sphere is the lithium cobalt oxide battery. Um, this is not really used in automotive um, applications, but you'll find them commonly in things like your phones, in your laptops. These have pretty high specific energy, which means that uh, you, know, you can turn on your laptop or use your phone for quite a long time, but low specific power, which you um, don't really need in these, in these applications. You're not running like motors or anything. It's just the sort of electronics um, in your computers or in your phones. Um, these tend to be in sort of smaller formats. Um, and that's because, right, these, they have relatively more expensive materials, especially the cobalt. Um, and that makes it slightly sort of more challenging to kind of scale this up to larger sizes. Um, and, you know, we're going to talk about some batteries that also have cobalt that are used in like automotive applications. Um, but uh, from a density perspective, they might be using less of that material. Um, low thermal stability and short life cycles. Um, yeah, and so these things can get hot. You know, I've seen all these you know, videos of people's phones catching on fire. It's related to the property of these batteries. Uh, okay, lithium manganese oxide. So this is similar to the chemistry that we were just talking about, but this excludes the cobalt, which is one of the sort of more expensive materials. Um, and it also makes it a little bit more sta um, stable thermally. Uh, these have the ability to charge quickly and have high specific power, right? But as I was mentioning, uh, there is a sort of direct trade-off in the energy density and power density and so these batteries will have a much lower energy density and they also have a relatively low cycle life. Um, the original Nissan Leaf, so the very first gen that was coming out in 2010 um, and, and some of the sort of um, subsequent year generations of the Leaf uh, use this lithium uh, battery. Uh, there are some variants, I don't know too much about this, um, that contain nickel, that might be something that we'll be seeing in the future, but we'll see. Uh, lithium titanium oxide, LTO. Um, so this is actually uh, referring to the anode, not the cathode. So they use these titanate nanocrystals instead of carbon. Um, and essentially what this allows for, faster recharging time and higher power with long life cycles. Um, these uh, again have lower energy density um, as a trade-off for this high power that you're getting. Um, and I believe this is gonna be a slightly sort of more expensive type of battery because of the, the titanium. Uh, this has been employed um, by the Mitsubishi um, my, uh, MIEV, uh, but this is not a sort of common format for lithium ion batteries. Okay, so we're getting to kind of like more and more popular applications uh, of, of these chemistries. Um, so this is the nickel cobalt aluminum oxide NCA battery. So this one is actually fairly common. Uh, so you're basically employing specific properties of um, you know, different compounds within or different um, like atoms within these batteries uh, to promote specific attributes that you want out of them. And so they found that like nickel increases the energy density 
Um, and so this has good specific power and a long life cycle. Um, not as safe as other lithium technologies. Um, so from a, a thermal stability standpoint, um, not as good. And so you might wanna be using sort of a more robust um, like cooling system uh, or a thermal management system for your battery. Um, the materials are fairly expensive, right? I've already pointed out about cobalt. Nickel is also um, pretty expensive. We're also gonna talk about in a different lecture, actually there'll be a, a guest lecture who we'll talk about some of the issues related specifically with cobalt. Um, and there are um, sort of mining issues uh, that, that we'll talk about in, in, in that lecture. Uh, so this, uh, this type of chemistry uh, was heavily employed by Tesla. So um, common in a lot of these models, so Model S, Model Y, Model X, and Model 3, um, they all at some point use the NCA. Um, Tesla has been migrating away from this chemistry towards something we'll talk about in a second um, for a variety of reasons, um, including you know, some of the, the issues related to, to cobalt, uh, also with the costs. Uh, the battery that most other automakers are using is this one, nickel manganese cobalt oxide. This one also has cobalt, um, has a very high energy density and a long life cycle. Um, so these are both things that you want in your car, right? You want long ranges, you want the battery to last a really long time. Um, and they combine, again, some of the properties of the different chemicals in order to um, get at sort of the best of both worlds, right? So the nickel is high energy, but unstable. Manganese is stable, but low energy. And when it's combined, you have a fairly stable chemistry with high energy density. Um, slightly lower power than other cobalt batteries, but it is, um, has pretty good thermal stability. Uh, and we can see there's a whole bunch of different vehicles um, on the market that use um, this type of chemistry. Uh, this isn't all of them, there's a much longer list. Um, you might have heard of General Motors Ultium batteries. Um, they sort of have been parading them around uh, as this sort of novel uh, technology, um, but the Ultium batteries are, are basically just um, nickel, manganese, cobalt. Um, there are some subtleties to this, right? So not everyone uses exactly the same type. Um, the ratio of nickel to manganese to cobalt might differ um, in, in certain types of batteries. Okay, and the last one I'll talk about is lithium iron phosphate. Um, so this is the one that Tesla has really been migrating to. Um, the materials are relatively cheap. You don't need some of these rare earth metals such as cobalt. Um, and it has high cycle life and power density and considered to be pretty safe, but it does have one issue of having relatively lower energy density, which means that relatively speaking, you might expect like a lower range from this particular type of chemistry. Okay, so that's like, high level information about these different chemistries. It's a lot of information to digest at once. Um, there are these like handy graphs like this that kind of help um, uh, to provide kind of a direct comparison between all of the chemistries. So I'm putting this here kind of as a reference for you. So these are known as, um, uh, wait, these aren't really spider, they're kind of like spider diagrams. The, the way that you read this, right, is that, um, the closer you are to the to one edge means the greater that particular attribute is. So for, for this NCA battery, it has the highest specific energy um, because the yellow goes all the way to the border compared to something like the LFP where it's a little bit farther away from the edge. And so it has relatively less 
specific energy compared to some of these other guys. Um, and then I don't know what they mean by performance. That could mean a lot of other things, but most of the other stuff is pretty straightforward. For example, um, the cost of the LFP, the LMO, um, cobalt oxide, um, and nickel manganese cobalt, I think um, those all have uh, sort of relatively similar costs, right? Because they all come to the sort of second to most outer edge, whereas this one will have the lowest cost out of all of these for NCA, because it only goes to the third most outer edge. Okay, and so you can kind of immediately, very quickly be able to sort of compare across all these different attributes, lifespan cost, um, specific energy, specific power, and safety. Any questions about this? All right, why don't we take a quick break for five minutes and we'll come back and talk about battery production. Okay, back to the lecture, everyone. So battery production, how are these batteries made? This is kind of a quick preview uh, of what will what will be probably talked about in the guest lecture a bunch, um, but also hopefully give some insight into some of the sort of problematic issues with certain types of um, certain types of production uh, lines for um, different battery chemistries. Okay, so all of them require lithium. Um, and so where are we getting that from? Uh, so the main guys are, uh, so the biggest one is in Chile. Um, but China and Australia both also have a fair bit of um, lithium production. Uh, far and away, the sort of largest bottleneck for a common material in, um, in these batteries is cobalt, which is almost entirely coming out of uh, Congo. And so there are a lot of sort of humanitarian um, and and rights issues um, related to the mining of, of cobalt coming out of here. Uh, and so uh, in addition to the fact that it's you know relatively expensive material compared to a lot of the other chemis, uh, chemical compounds that you'd have in in these batteries, um, a lot of these other sort of human human rights issues have kind of motivated, uh, producers to look at different chemistries to use in with in their vehicles. Yeah. Uh, I guess not. <laughs> this isn't this isn't actually really my area of specialty. Um, but yeah, so just because so from a raw material standpoint um there is the sort of mining and extraction of the materials um and re relative to um a lot of these other locations um it it might not even be the case where like north america doesn't have it it might just be too expensive for them to to produce yeah so like so think of it this way like you you're an investor or you are an automaker or you're um, you know, one of the later stages of battery production and you wanna buy uh, materials, right? Um, and you say, okay, what would it take to start up a new mine and, and you know, figure out where the resource is and then um, extract it you know, with the sort of labor practices that you have in the US and maybe relatively higher cost of labor um all of those things go into that kind of decision making as well so it might not necessarily be just resource availability yeah but it is it is surprising and and 
you know, even despite some of these things, you maybe you'll see um, resource extraction for some of these materials in, in, in the future. Um, again, not my sort of direct area of expertise, but that, that would kind of be my, my impression for, for what's happening here. Okay, so what about the sort of physical parts of the battery? Um, okay, so if you, let me just actually, I'll pull out these batteries out of my little pointer here. Um, all right, so this common thing that you guys are used to seeing, this is, um, this is a single sort of battery cell, right? Um, and you might think, well, the format of this is like pretty different from like this giant pack that you would see in a car. Um, but actually your car might just be something like a bunch of, I mean, they are basically a bunch of cells put together. Um, and it's not going to be a, you know, a Duracell uh, battery, right? These are all different chemistries, right? But they are formed together through a series of cells um, that get packed together into what are known as modules. Um, so these basic cells, um, uh, once they get put together into these modules, which is two cells or more connected in some kind of linear or parallel way uh, in order to get um, you know, more power out of it, for example, um, those can then be uh, combined into these sort of larger battery packs, okay? And um, you go from cell module to pack, uh, let's say a cell, or let's say, sorry, let's say a module has 10 cells and let's say a battery pack has 10 modules. That doesn't mean that the pack costs the equivalent of hundred cells. It doesn't scale linearly because um, as you go up, you might be sort of adding certain kind of control components or, uh, or uh, cooling, heating elements um, to sort of different stages of this construction. And so um, the, the sort of cost of these things can scale in pretty nonlinear ways. Um, and so it's important when we talk about the cost of a battery to think about whether they're referring to the cell or the module or the pack. Okay, so um, form factors. So you can construct the cell in basically just these three ways. These are the three sort of most common, um, cylindrical, prismatic, and pouch. And so we talked about the sort of three elements of the battery, right? You have your cathode, which is your positive electrode, your anode, your negative electrode, um, and then the electrolyte. There's also the casing and separators for these things. Um, and you can see how these are sort of arranged, right? So cells, um, cylindrical cells have lower packing density but have higher mechanical stability and better thermal management. Okay, so let's, let's break that down. It's actually pretty straightforward, lower packing, de packing density, right? So a cylindrical cell, that's kind of like the Duracell that I was just showing you. Think about if you were to put a bunch of them together, right, in uh, like that honeycomb formation, right? You would still have uh, empty space, right, in between, and so, the ability to pack these guys uh, is gonna be less dense than if I have sort of these um, prismatic or pouches, which are flat right up, up against each other. So you don't really have any sort of empty space in between the cells. So that's why they have lower packing density, um, but they have higher mechanical stability. Um, and so the reason why this is important is because these guys um, have corners here, right? Um, and the way in which these things might be bent um, or um, the way that they might respond to like shock um, could lead to sort of lower stability 
and you could have like thermal runaway events. So this is exactly the issue. Um, this was the exact issue with uh, the Chevy bolts. Um, if you guys recall the recent recalls um, over the last year where uh, GM basically had to recall all of the Chevy bolts. They spent billions of dollars to replace, replace the batteries. It was actually um, the company, the battery company that was responsible for building the cells uh, on the edge, they, the, they crimp them and uh, they weren't, I guess, completely sealed. Uh, and that led to um, events where that allowed for um, the electrodes to kind of contact each other and leads to thermal runaway events um, where the battery gets hot and catches on fire or maybe even explodes. Um, so there are definitely, definitely sort of trade-offs between the different form factors of batteries and the way that you construct them. Um, yeah, and so maybe you're going to get sort of higher density, energy density, you get more range, right? Maybe that makes it easier for you to sell your vehicle, but maybe that leads to these events where your car might be more likely to catch on fire, right? Um, and so... Battery manufacturers and producers and automakers have to contend with a lot of these trade-offs. Um, and it's important to understand the properties of these different form factors to kind of go in and, and make those decisions. Um, yeah, and so the prismatic cells have higher stress at the corners. Um, the pouch cells are pretty interesting. Um, they don't have a rigid enclosure like uh, like the cylindrical and prismatic ones do. And so these guys can actually swell up when they get used. Okay, uh, so the battery manufacturing process looks something like this. Um, again, sort of not my area of expertise, but these, um, these processes are, uh, sort of fairly common in the manufacturing process. I've been to some of these factories before um, and especially for the like startup ones, these might just be these, you know, machines right on the, on the, uh, on the factory floor. Um, and as they get sort of better and better at uh, production and have more experience in producing these, uh, a lot of these processes get more streamlined and that's one of the big areas where you can uh, lower the costs of, of your batteries. Um, yeah, because you have so many different steps, there's lots of opportunities for, for cost reductions. Okay, and so um, this might just be um, the place where you are doing the production of the cells and uh, you might be selling your cells to different um, battery uh, production um, locations and, and factories where then they would be sort of constructing them into sort of modules or packs. There's a lot of different um, formations of businesses that handle uh, different amounts of this sort of upstream process, whether you are going all the way from the raw materials to the cells to the modules and pack construction, or you're just doing sort of part of that. You guys may have heard of these giant gigafactories. So um, Tesla, right, has a really big one uh, in Nevada, right? So as, um, as you have more and more electric vehicles, obviously you have to produce more and more batteries. And so these guys are gonna be um, increasingly uh, common uh, all around the world. Um, even though you might have only heard of the Tesla Gigafactory, there are probably a lot more uh, out there than, than you would imagine. Um, so even just Tesla already has a number of different sort of factory locations um, in California, in Nevada, Texas, uh, and in New York. Um, and you can see who a lot of the other players are, uh, even just in, in North America. Um, 
not all of these are sort of in place yet. Uh, some of them are sort of um, planning to be built or up and coming over the next couple of years. Uh, but you can be sure that this is right a really rapidly growing um, uh, growing area. And then um, in countries like China, they already have far and away more sort of gigafactories um, than than even what you, you're seeing here. Uh, and their production of electric vehicles um, rivals kind of the rest of the world combined. And so they, obviously need to have a lot of these guys in order to keep up with um, with the demand for their EVs. Yeah, and so you can, this is kind of the same information. You can see over the next, just the next couple of years already, a bunch of automakers um, and a bunch of battery companies are planning to expand in and open these sort of really large scale battery plants um, in the next couple of years. Um, to give you a sense of um, internationally for, uh, for the US where the batteries are being produced. Okay, and so this, is, this isn't you know, for all vehicles, this is just for vehicles being sold in the US. Um, from the cell perspective, a lot of them are coming from Japan. Um, and then they get imported into the US uh, and get constructed to the full size battery pack. Um, there are some imports for battery packs, as you can see here, um, but not, not a huge amount. Um, yeah, and so uh, especially when it comes to the construction of battery cells, um, there's a sort of rapid growth in this production. Um, so the world, the rest of the world is able to help um, produce the supply for the US and, and make money. Okay, um, any questions about this stuff? So on to the last um, poll question related to uh, the cost of batteries. Um, yeah, so I, I saw a figure uh, recently coming out of the, the recently, actually the, the IPCC report that came out yesterday about how lithium ion battery costs have decreased by like 97% in the last two decades. So they certainly have come down, yeah, quite, quite a bit. So this is a famous paper from um, Nature Climate Change, which is one of the sort of more prestigious academic journals that you can publish in. So this paper was published in 2014. And what the authors did is they went around and they asked, um, they basically asked a bunch of automakers, uh, battery industry experts and other academics about how battery prices had come down over the last decade, as well as how they would, ex uh, how these experts would expect battery prices uh, and the trajectory of battery prices to change over the next couple decades. So this is all, so up to 2014, everything to the left of that is historical data. And you can see um, the sort of black line is a pretty sort of rough, um, rough average of the sort of estimates. Okay. And so there are a big range, right? Because you, you're talking about different designs of batteries, different chemistries of batteries. This is for the pack, right? And so there's lots of different, um, different ways that you can uh, configure the pack. But generally we're talking about on the order of something like a uh, thousand to $1,700 per kilowatt hour coming down to maybe $500, $400, dollars per kilowatt hour in um, 2014. Okay, so there is this like red shaded area down here. Um, and that starts at $150 per kilowatt hour. So that is what everyone kind of considered the magic number to be for um, not for when you so if, if I were to go buy an electric car and compare it to like 
a comparable gas car at $150 per kilowatt hour, that's the rough price that, it, that the cars would break even over the lifetime. So the electric vehicle would still be more expensive when you bought, buy it, right? But because gas prices cost more than electricity, over the lifetime, you would make that money back. And so at 150 at this red line, we say, okay, they're, they're about the same. So no one really talks about 150 anymore um, because we, we're definitely past that. We blew past that uh, probably a couple of years ago. I think now, I think most people generally agree we're maybe between, let's say 100 and $130 per kilowatt hour. So the interesting thing is that there are no experts um, across all these different groups of people that they interviewed that predicted that we would be below this sort of red line until maybe 2030. And even then, most people thought it would be above that. So we've, we've gone to decrease the cost of these batteries more than um, any sort of experts predicted. So, you know, experts aren't always right including me. Um, so you, don't, you have to caveat everything that I'm saying as well. Um, so the, num the new number that people are talking about is $85 per kilowatt hour. And that number refers to um, the price at which we think that an electric vehicle will cost the same as a gas car, even at the point of sale, right? So we know generally now for a comparable car, EVs are gonna be cheaper over their lifetime. Um, given that they're below this 150. And that's more or less true, um, but really for, uh, from a perspective of like mass adoption, right? Maybe the $85 per kilowatt hour is the sort of um, promising target that, that we wanna get to. Okay, any questions about that? Yeah. Consumer, yeah. Uh, no, I think they have. I think a lot of fleets, you know, when you're talking about operators who really just care about the um, the sort of monetary outlook of, you know, whatever equipment that they're using, there definitely has been a shift. Uh, I will, however, say um, that sometimes the uncertainty of the like operational aspects of the vehicle has led to some hesitation. Um, so for example, if you know that, you, uh, that in your vehicle fleet, the duty cycle is really high and you have to drive like 500 miles a day or something like that, right? They might still shy away despite the economics because you know the sort of charging issues and the, and the time that it takes to do that. Um, might might cause them not not to do that, but yeah, like fleets are definitely way more sort of rational actors than consumers, and so from a like a proportional uptake, I think that they do that you do see higher sort of adoption um, for them compared to just like regular buyers. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, so what do the prices kind of look like? Um, yeah, so this is kind of the trajectory since 2010. Again, this is like roughly speaking, right? This, this uh, depends on a lot of factors, depends who you ask, um, but the trend is pretty clear and most experts agree that we were, so this is back in 2020, right? We're in 2022 now. Um, most experts agree that we've sort of fallen well below this $150 per kilowatt hour target. Okay, so that is about all the sort of modern day battery stuff. And so I did mention before that there might be sort of more sort of revolutionary opportunities. So a lot of these things about um, 
fine tuning the chemistries, um, getting sort of better practices for the production process, all of these things are going to help incrementally lower the costs um, and, and therefore the price of the batteries. Um, but there are some novel chemistries that, um, that haven't been used before that may potentially replace some of the, um, some of the existing chemistries. Okay, and so what are some of these new things that, we'll, that we can uh, look at? So yeah, so lots of improvements in current lithium ion batteries. Um, there's still lots of ways you can sort of tinker around with these things um, and, and get them better, get them cheaper, make them more efficient. Um, but future battery chemistries that kind of exist in the lab and not really in practice um, may offer a lot of sort of like revolutionary changes, like where you might jump really high in energy density or in power density. Um, but there's still lots of barriers to commercialization, um, especially in terms of like costs and safety, especially safety, a lot of them kind of just explode. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, yeah, so a lot of the anodes these days use graphite materials. Um, but here they're thinking about, um, so this was the chart from before. Um, so this is the lithium metal compared to the lithium ion. So you can see where it improves in some of the density aspects um, moving to the right. Uh, so extremely high energy density, um, but unfortunately, um, so if you, if you look at this battery um, where you have the cathode here, you have your electrolyte in the middle, and then you have your anode on the other side. Um, this is a chart that displays some of the common issues related to lithium metal anodes. Um, so there's these things called dendrites where the, the structure of the anode forms these like crystalline tendrils that move, that, that because of the properties of the energy difference between your anode and cathode naturally want to migrate towards the cathode. And so what happens if you touch the anode to the cathode? It allows for you to instantly release all of that energy in the battery. It's going to get really hot and it's probably going to explode. Um, so yeah, so um, despite some of the sort of really promising things that you can get out of a lithium metal uh, anode, uh, if you can't kind of solve these problems, then it's probably not a good idea to use this battery or this type of um, configuration in your battery. <laughs> okay, another one um, is a lithium sulfur battery. So very high specific energy. Um, and one of the nice things about this is that sulfur is way, way, way cheaper than cobalt. Um, unfortunately, there's this thing that happens. So the way, uh, the way the lithium ions sort of move between your cathode and an anode are via these, uh, I think they call these um, sulfur, lithium sulfur shuttles. And so these things will kind of shuttle the lithium back and forth. But what ends up happening is you get these long chains of sulfur. Um, they're called polysulfide leakage um, from the cathode. Um, and so you lose, you actually lose material out of your cathode. Um, and you have this like volume expansion uh, and, and that leads to, I guess, accelerated degradation uh, of your battery, lower efficiency. Um, yeah, and so this is promising from the standpoint of, again, getting very high energy density, um, but it suffers this sort of unique thing uh, that happens in the way that it shuffles the lithium ions. Yeah. 
what's writ written here? Yeah. Oh, this is uh, lithium, Li plus. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, solid state batteries, also a really sort of interesting concept. So I showed you this sort of picture before where you have your anode, your cathode, and then you have a liquid electrolyte. Um, so a solid state battery has a totally solid electrolyte separating your anode and your cathode. So this from an energy density perspective is like way, way, way higher, um, even talking about the, the last two. So two and a half times higher than existing chemistries. So you can imagine, right, for a car company um, that has a 250 mile battery range, if you could do this with, let's say, basically the same material, um, and you can have a solid electrolyte instead, you could have your car go at 750 mile range instead of a 250 mile range um, for uh, you know, similar battery sort of properties. Um, it also avoids the sort of toxic materials in your electrolyte, and there's a lower risk of catching fire. But these things are very expensive. Uh, they're temperature sensitive and similar to, uh, well, the oftentimes the anodes also use this lithium metal thing. And so you have the same issues with dendrites here. So um, yeah, you might have explodey batteries, unfortunately. Okay, uh, lithium air. Um, so you can see in this same chart that we had before, lithium air is kind of like up in that direction. It's, it's quite sort of revolutionary. Um, it, in, in terms of like magnitude of what you could get out of it, in theory, uh, it's miles ahead, right? So here's your lithium ion. Um, sort of practical and theoretical specific energy, right? And this is your lithium air, um, way, way higher. Um, and so the concept of, it and, and why it's called an air battery is that it actually uses oxygen from the air to reduce at the cathode. And so when I'm discharging the battery, you suck in air from your environments um, and that allows for uh, your lithium, uh, lithium ions to travel um, to your anode and, and therefore discharge uh, and, and lead to electricity production. Um, so this has energy density that's comparable to the energy density of gasoline, which is right miles higher than uh, sort of what you're seeing out of a, out of a battery. Um, so five times higher um, that have already actually been demonstrated in practice in labs to do this. Um, but again, there are a lot of sort of practical issues with um, the construction of these uh, and, and in practice, how you could kind of make this work is still uh, pretty challenging. Okay, so this one's actually pretty interesting. Um, I didn't know too much about this. My sort of director told me to, to put this slide in. Um, there is uh, this novel thing where you have hybrid cell batteries. So this is not actually using any new chemistries. So remember, I talked about all these different um, uh, lithium batteries. You got NCA, NMO, LFP, all, all of these different chemistries. And so some automakers apparently are now combining different cell chemistries into a single module or pack. And um, that helps you combine some of the benefits of different types of batteries together. Um, there's a battery producer called Neo, which is making this 75 kilowatt hour hybrid cell where it uses both um, NCM and LFP chemistries together. Um, and so it's able to get sort of relatively high energy densities at a much sort of lower cost because it's using some LFP cells. 
Um, yeah, and so the combination of different chemistries, I think, is becoming a really sort of serious area of investigation for a lot of uh, automakers. Um, so even if, even if a lot of the crazy chemistries that I just mentioned don't pan out, the solid state, the lithium air, um, uh, the lithium metal, uh, this type of stuff is like a pretty sort of novel area of, of exploration for a lot of uh, automakers to, yeah, possibly make some pretty big changes in, um, in the way that battery packs are, are, um, are put together and, and the associated attributes of those batteries in new vehicles. Yeah, so this is, I think, probably, in my opinion, maybe one of the more sort of promising areas that we'll see over the, the next, uh, next couple of years. Um, I think if any of the other guys, you know, the lithium air, solid state, lithium sulfur, if any of these things end up getting realized, I think they'll be pretty big game changers um, in, uh, in the EV space, um, but they still have to overcome a lot of the like practical challenges in the lab. They need to stop exploding um, before we can rely on them. Okay, so what does the future hold for these batteries? Um, more growth means there's gonna be a lot stronger sort of pressure and a lot of money, right, for these producers to improve the batteries. Um, we've already seen sort of really rapid improvements in batteries over the last decade uh, and really rapid cost reductions, more than basically any of the world's leading experts were predicting. Um, and potentially we might see these revolutionary chemistries happen. Um, you know, we'll see, we'll see if that actually ends up happening. Um, but in the meantime, I think there's still plenty of space for improvements with what we have. Um, and that's just going to mean, uh, easier access for, um, uh, populations today. And not only are they getting cheaper, but we're seeing, right, um, we're seeing the vehicles getting longer and longer ranges, which again, will make them uh, more compelling. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have for today. Uh, one quick administrative announcement. Um, I guess there have been some questions about the units for this class. Um, so even though it's a variable unit on the schedule builder, it's officially a four unit class. So you have to make it four units. I can't really change that. If you don't change it on your own, someone's gonna get mad at me and it, mad at you. Um, so just change it to four units before we both get in trouble. All right, thanks all. I will see you on Monday.